Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. I want to thank the organizing committee, uh, obviously, for inviting me. Uh, uh, and also uh, uh, Janine Turner and Rod Holland and Philip Tata in particular. Uh, they've been very, very helpful at, uh, uh, in uh, the whole process here. Uh, and it's really, uh, really nice to, to be here at the University of Bath. Uh, Paul Zemkowski has for the last 30 years been trying to teach me how to say it right. It's always the University of Bath, you know, if you're from Detroit, Chicago, places like that, you know. Uh, so it was, it was really great also to be at the pump room and at the Roman baths. Uh, baths. Uh, let me just quit on that one, okay. <laughs> uh, at any event, um, uh, I am, I, I should say, first of all, full disclosure, a student of network analysis, not an expert whatsoever. But we've been doing a lot of work in this area. And what I wanted to do was to sort of uh, uh, use some of the examples from some of the work from our group uh, to illustrate uh, potential ways that this might be useful to people in CBT. Uh, so it's, we sort of have some sort of potential clinical uh, relevance, I hope, to this new perspective in psychopathology. But I also wanted to uh, uh, give hats off to my colleague, Denny Borsman from the University of Amsterdam, a psychometrician who sort of wandered into our field of psychopathology, and also Anjali Kramer, who is a former PhD student, now a, a faculty member down at Tilburg, associate professor. They, uh, these two folks and their colleagues have to give them a lot of credit because they've really uh, really uh, uh, stimulate a tremendous amount of work. Okay, uh, I want to start with sort of a simple uh, uh, observation here about uh, symptoms of psychopathology. That's, of course, all obvious to everyone. Is that symptoms do not co-occur randomly. They don't occur randomly. Some are more likely to occur, uh, co-occur together than others are. Uh, you know, we say in traditional psychiatric parlance that they are uh, occurring syndromically, right? So they hang together as, as symptoms as a, a syndrome. The question is, why? Uh, well, the, the standard view, the received view in our field is that, uh, well, they share a common cause, namely the underlying disorder, the disease entity, right? So symptoms then are sort of deemed to be reflective of the latent entity that produces their emergence and uh, co-occurrence. And by latent here, I mean Something that's not directly observable, but is, is potentially observable, and that it's sort of the engine, this, this sort of uh, common cause that is driving the emergence of the symptoms and their, their co-occurrence. Now, this, uh, this holds for sort of these categorical ideas that's sort of uh, implicit in our DSMs, since DSM-3 onward, but also with dimensional models as well. So, for example, Dave Barlow has argued uh, that we really uh, need to go back to the future, as, as he says, and, and look at neuroticism as this underlying latent dimension uh, that is productive of a, a diverse range of, of symptoms. Now, here's actually a, a little uh, diagram from uh, Denny and uh, Angelique's uh, article a few years ago. You know, it shows we've got here, uh, uh, we have depressed mood, loss of interest, etc. All these are different uh, symptoms of reflective of something called major depressive disorder, the underlying latent variable. Now, so there's some key assumptions behind this sort of model that's implicit in our, our standard view of psychopathology, that the underlying entity, the disease or the disorder, whatever you want to call it, is the cause of the symptoms that reflect its presence. It's a reflective model. Uh, and also, this also implies that the disorder is distinct from its symptoms, right? So you have the cause, and then you have the effects. Two different things, right? <clears throat> then you've got this issue of the axiom of local independence. Now, I must confess that I've interviewed many patients over the years, assessed them for panic disorder, OCD, depression, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and never did I brood over whether the symptoms that they're complaining of satisfy the axiom of local independence. Like, what, what, what the heck is this? Has seldom troubled the sleep of people like me in any event. Till Borsman pointed this out a few years ago, that if we're going to uh, license an inference to an underlying entity, this latent variable that is the cause of the symptoms, uh, that the, they, the symptoms really need to satisfy this axiom of local independence. So what that means is that function, symptoms should be functionally unrelated once one conditionalizes on the presence of the latent common cause. Right? So once you take into account the common cause, uh, well, the symptoms should be uh, uh, you know, not related. Now, now one case is uh, temperature, for example, uh, where we have a, um, uh, well, to give an example of where this axiom is satisfied, suppose I were to bring, uh, say, uh, half a dozen mercury thermometers into this room, and we sort of set them around the room like this, and then 
I go check the mercury levels a few minutes later, and lo and behold, they all show 72 degrees. Well, if it's America, it would be 72 degrees. Normal room temperature. Why is that the case? Well, it's a common cause. You've got the whole kinetic uh, theories of molecules, the temperature, and so on and so forth. The common cause is the underlying temperature that produces the mercury levels. And to show that these are, in fact, locally independent, I'm going to take an ice cube and put it on that thermometer, and the mercury will drop. But the mercury will be, remain unaffected for all the other symptoms. Excuse me, uh, thermometers. Another case a little bit closer to our field in medicine, oncology, case of a malignant uh, lung tumor, right? So someone, for example, is say, coughing a lot and, and he's spitting up blood, having chest pain. You know, the doctor says, oh my God, uh-oh, this, this could be trouble. So they do a um, chest x-ray and there's a little spot in the lungs. Like, oh, geez. And then they do a biopsy and lo and behold, they discover the common cause of the, the covariance uh, of these uh, symptoms. Uh, an underlying latent variable, now no longer latent because now we've observed it and we've actually measured it in a biopsy, the malignant tumor. Okay? So axiom of local independence, satisfied. However, how plausible is this for most of the topics in psychopathology? We often find the failure of the axiom of local independence. So for, let's consider depression, for example. So yeah, let's suppose you got someone who's been ruminating Right, about some worrying, worrying, rooming, go, running like this, and they can't fall asleep. And then, much to your surprise, they're fatigued the next day. There's a real bold prediction, a Popperian bold conjecture. Yeah, if they can't sleep, we tired. there's a connection there. And their concentration might be impaired, et cetera, et cetera. Or bulimia nervosa. Someone who has a fear of becoming fat, so they start restraining their eating in such a way that they get very hungry, and then they binge, and they go, oh my God, what did I do? They stress, and then they purge. So when we think about this, these symptoms are obviously not locally independent, for crying out loud. They're related. Surprise, surprise. Symptoms are causally interconnected, so it seems. And so in this case, the disorder is not really distinct from its indicators. It's not like you've got like the malignant uh, lung tumor, and then you've got uh, the, these uh, uh, coughing and bloody sputum and so forth. Not like that. Um, so, for example, we could have the concept of a silent tumor, right? So someone, uh, you haven't discovered it yet until you've d done your biopsy and so forth, and you can discover this is not really the case for our field. In the most cases, trisomy 21 and Down syndrome would be an example, uh, uh, one of the rare examples in our field, right? When you have the features of Down's patients that is connected to uh, having three copies, or at least three partial copies of uh, chromosome 21. Now, okay, so, um, so disorders in, we say someone has depression or panic disorder, whatever it might be, we're, we're actually designating this sort of emergent property, so sort of an emergent phenomenon. So symptoms then under the network view are not fallible indicators of a latent underlying category dimension, but rather they, con they constitute a network of functionally interrelated elements. So an episode of mental disorder is an activation of this causal network kind of how things are viewed under this way. The elements here of, um, of uh, networks uh, in general, we have nodes, these little circles, which usually are symptoms, not always. I'll give examples otherwise. Uh, and then edges. Edges are lines, or uh, connecting the two different nodes. Uh, sometimes they're called arcs, but uh, nodes and edges. Connections between symptoms, in most of the network analyses, these tend to indicate the strength of association between two elements, uh, usually some form of a correlation. Uh, and now, network analysis also provides different types of metrics that are, that are uh, unusual or unique, I think, really, to this approach. One is something called strength centrality. Uh, so, for example, if we have a symptom that's high on strength centrality, uh, what this means is that there are a lot of different um, edges emanating from this node or connected to this node. And the strength of it is simply the absolute value of these uh, 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 edge weights, right? And so, for example, uh, so this is usually the case. It usually some form of a correlation. It's different for Bayesian network analysis. I'll talk about that a little bit later. But it's the number of edges connected to the node weighted by the magnitude of the connections. Now, highly central symptoms are different from hallmark symptoms. You know, for example, when I was working on the dsm 4 a long time ago, one of the bugaboos, supposedly, uh, in, in our categorical system of diagnosis is, is that we, we had a lot of these so-called nonspecific symptoms. So a lot of people who have mental disorders have problems with impaired attention, impaired concentration, difficulty sleeping, 
There's all these nonspecific symptoms. What we should be doing is purifying our disorders and only having hallmark symptoms. Ones are highly characteristic of one syndromic cluster, but less so with others, such as maybe flashbacks and emotional numbing with PTSD, for example. But sleep problems, concentration, you know, these nonspecific ones. Now, so the hallmark symptoms are the ones that are, tend to be really strongly connected with one cluster, but not others. Um, they're not really pathognomonic, but you know, kind of getting close to that. Highly central symptoms may or may not be hallmark ones. So for example, you may have a symptom such as problems with sleep that may be connected with a lot of different disorders, and some symptoms are shared by others. So the, uh, so, so the centrality metrics, like strength centrality, is identifying the symptoms that are connected to a lot of other ones in the network in such a way that if you turn on, activate this one symptom, and if the edges are issuing rather enter, than entering uh, that node, uh, th then you think, wow, you know, these are the symptoms we ought to be targeting. Ones that are that when activated are, caught, are activating and maintaining other symptoms. You turn off the lights on those, turn down the volume, you should be able to foster rapid healing from the syndrome, supposedly. Uh, this, uh, so there's a number of things um, that uh, uh, th this sort of offers here. First of all, the network analysis has kind of a solution to the comorbidity problem. I think uh, when she was a graduate student, Angelique Kramer wrote a BBS paper on this. When she says, well, here's a sort of a diagram. I don't know if you got a pointer here. Is there a pointer here someplace? Let's see. Ah, nope, doesn't work. Oh, well. Uh, we have disorder A and we have disorder B. This is the classic way we look at comorbidity, right? We get these two syndromes. And we're, um, then, we, then we got these uh, symptoms that are kind of in between here. The network analysis of this looks at uh, disorders in a very different way. So we see the different clusters are these sort of clusters of tightly interconnected nodes, symptoms. And then we got some of these symptoms are bridge symptoms, those shared by the, uh, by the two clusters. And so the reason why it's such nonspecific symptoms might be quite important. Just imagine, for example, if you've got, say, sleep problems and concentration problems, two classic nonspecific symptoms, and suppose they're shared by, say, depression and generalized anxiety disorder, for example, and you turn on those two bridge symptoms, which you could have, uh, you turn these on and activation goes in both directions, you know, causing two clusters to activate. So those, these nonspecific symptoms are actually really important to, to the comorbid picture, right? And that's exactly what you'd be producing in this case. You have the clinical picture of comorbidity, which, you know, people, we see this, right? We're assessing patients. But this might be one way that this occurs. Uh, so uh, one of the things about network analysis, was sort of ironic for certain people who were trained in CBT, functional behavior analysis and so forth, prior to the DSM-3-Neo-Kreplinian revolution, uh, there's people in this room, I know, including myself, who are trained in that tradition. Uh, and, and, and this sort of, the network analysis fits much, much better, really, with functional cognitive behavioral analysis. I mean, it sort of fits kind of a lot of things we do. I mean, we're really often treating symptoms and their connections, not the disorders per se, in some sense. You're targeting different things, whether you're saying exposure and response prevention for um, OCD, for example. The promise of the centrality metrics I mentioned already. Uh, so we might, when we're doing network analysis, we might find particular targets that would be really suitable for um, uh, early intervention. Uh, another thing here, to get now into some of the uh, examples from some of our, our data, is that network analysis sometimes can uh, recover sort of things that we already knew clinically, but sometimes they can point to some connections that are not always so obvious to even the, clean, the trained clinical eye. So this is one of our early studies way back in 2015 that we did with post-traumatic stress disorder symptoms. These were earthquake survivors. And the network analysis here, this is a, a simple association network here. Uh, and um, this is just looking at the connections uh, among all the symptoms here. This is what's called a concentration network. Uh, this is simply a partial correlation network. So essentially, the edges that survive, uh, for example, uh, um, Oh, such as uh, hyper, uh, hypervigilance and startle reactions, the ones, uh, and, and you find that they survive the, um, uh, uh, the, 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 the procedure, the computation of a con concentration network. So you're looking at the partial correlations. When the dust settles, yep, there's a direct connection controlling, adjusting for the presence of all other symptoms between being hypervigilant and startling, okay? Now, this is an undirected network. 
So we don't know whether or not uh, people who are really hypervigilant tend to be startled a lot, or if you go around startling PTSD patients, it'll be more hypervigilant or both. We don't really know that, but we do know it's a direct connection. There's not a third variable problem here driving this. Uh, now, the other thing um, uh, 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 that happens here with, uh, with these is it will often see, uh, sort of confirm what we already know. So intrusive symptoms, intrusive symptoms and dreams about the, night, about the trauma and flashbacks, those are, those are kind of connected. And so some people say, well, what have you told me that I didn't know already? Well, that's true. Of course, if the network analysis violated all clinical wisdom, we'd start wondering about the math and driving it. Uh, but so it, you, we, we recover some of the things that we knew already, but then we find other things over here that are not as obvious. The role of anger in, in sleep uh, and anger in concentration impairment. So ones that are not necessarily the first things that come to mind when you think about post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, network analysis also offers some different ways of looking at risk factors. Um, so another one of our old studies, 2014, uh, Don Robinow, uh, my PhD student at the time, was the first author on this project. And what we were examining here was this large public uh, community data set on older Americans called the clock study, the changing lives of older uh, adults, and, uh, older something like that, yeah, older adults. <laughs> Uh, uh, but Ron Kessler had uh, collected these data, and, um, uh, and there were different measurement points, and to cut right to the chase, what we are interested in is that you got these older couples in their 60s, we f they f then they're followed up again, and in between that period of time, a bunch of them lost their spouse, uh, so the spousal bereavement, right? We are interested in the symptoms of so-called complicated grief, uh, and so... Um, so, some, so a lot of these folks had lost a spouse. We focused in on them. We were wondering, what are some of the differences uh, when we look at the network connections between symptoms of complicated uh, grief in people with and without people that appear to have, uh, uh, who, uh, you know, who have they've lost their spouse, uh, and then as a function of social support. So for example, uh, we broke down the bereaved individuals, the survivors, obviously, uh, into uh, folks whose spouse was really their primary social support source. You know, and, and then uh, and other, other individuals had a lot of their friends and family and so forth that they could share and talk to and socialize with, et cetera. Now, <clears throat> we, we know that social support is an important variable in a lot of different syndromes, including uh, post-traumatic, uh, or excuse me, uh, uh, complicated grief. So we looked at the network analysis, and here we found the individuals had a lot of folks pre-bereavement who are sources of social support, and low social support was really when the spouse was kind of pretty much it, their, their, their connection to the social world. Uh, and what we see here uh, is you find, uh, 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 you get similar edges in both. These are the different, I'm not going to go into the details here, but what you see here is a lot of strong interconnections. The edges are quite strong in those with low, low social support. What that implies then is that when people have one symptom, of a, a, a bereavement symptom, they're more likely to have others. And so activation tends to spread and it tends to be maintained. So one of the ways in which low social support heightens people's risk is it seems to be linked to uh, having high, elevated probabilities of activation among the symptoms that characterize the syndrome. They're much less strong with, a high, with high social support people. So if some people get some symptoms, you know, they, 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 they feel lonely, for example, but, but, um, but, uh, but that's less likely to, say, give them foreshortened future where they can't see beyond that, uh, just as an example. Um, another thing that network analysis can do is sort of give you sort of a new way of visualizing um, the um, syndromes that are sort of kind of on a, seen as on a continuum. So for example, take social anxiety disorder. Here you have a situation where uh, there's been a lot of debate and discussion about are we pathologizing normal shyness and things of that sort. And so a lot of people in the general population will have some symptoms like people don't like to speak in public, for example, a very, very common fear, but they don't have social phobia don't have SAD. So uh, how do we characterize something that is usually seen as someone's above the threshold and not uh, for uh, diagnosis? Well, the network analysis can uh, illustrate some different ways that this can occur. Alexander Aaron, who's now a professor in Belgium, is a postdoc in my lab. We were looking at some data 
from uh, folks who were uh, in studies, a variety of studies uh, some he, that he ran, some we did together, on um, social anxiety disorder, experimental studies, but there were people who met the diagnostic criteria and then control subjects who did not, but who did have some symptoms of shyness, just like everybody does in general, right? So we, wanted to, we looked at the two different type of networks. So you look at the ordinary shyness versus, if you will, SAD. Uh, and uh, this is the control group here. I'm just going to toggle between these. We've arranged it so we get the same, uh, uh, the same relations between the symptoms. But you see, with the control group, you, you, you get um, you know, fewer edges. Uh, and, uh, 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 and, and some of these here will, will, will appear for the first time uh, with, the, um, uh, with the social anxiety disorder group. And others are just simply uh, thicker. So for example, we got here... Uh, with uh, um, uh, people who are afraid of throwing a party, you know, oh, that's over here, this one r right here, uh, 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 they are, uh, you know, somewhat less likely, uh, or more likely to uh, uh, be afraid of taking tests, uh, but it's much more pronounced here with the social anxiety uh, disorder uh, group. And, uh, uh, or, or, or for example, we have uh, with a control group, there's no connection uh, uh, you know, between being afraid to talk to strangers and eating in public. Right here, these two here, and boom, whoops. Uh, but, but, the, but you get this edge here. Uh, and so what happens with the social anxiety disorder sort of people, you see some of the edges typically getting stronger that are present in the merely shy but not the disordered, or edges that appear for the first time. So the, likely, you know, the likelihood that, uh, that someone in the... Uh, uh, diagnostic, who is SAD diagnostically, is uh, not only going to be afraid of talking to strangers, but just eating in front of them, okay? Okay, uh, uh, another thing you can do with the network analysis is um, uh, you can look at relations between clusters of things that are theoretically connected, uh, but sometimes it's quite uh, ambiguous. So, for example, the issue of complicated grief that I've mentioned before and post-traumatic growth. This topic about post-traumatic growth, uh, this came out of uh, 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 Rich Tedeschi uh, uh, and his co colleague Calhoun. Calhoun. They were the, sort of the key figures in uh, developing this idea that has often been witnessed clinically. When someone's been exposed to some terrible traumatic event, they often have PTSD symptoms, have some depression symptoms. Many people do recover. Um, but sometimes they'll say, you know, uh, like with Nietzsche, you know, uh, in Nietzsche's statement that what doesn't kill me makes me stronger, that sometimes people will say, you know, I'm actually a better person for having survived this. Uh, that, it, yes, I had these terrible symptoms, but at the same time, I, my priorities have changed, my values have changed in beneficial ways. So there's been ways I've grown, so to speak, psychologically. This has sometimes been an elusive concept, and its relation to PTSD has been one that's controversial. Some people have suggested it's sort of a curvilinear relation, that when a person has relatively minor stresses, they don't have so many opportunities for growth. And if they're totally devastated, they really can't get the, the traction. Sometimes maybe it's in the middle, but a complicated issue. Uh, in this study here, what we did, we looked at young people. These are college students from the University of Memphis. Our colleague Bob Niemeyer had collected these data, and we, um, and we asked the question, when, when they've lost someone, and it was, uh, uh, so these are bereaved college students, uh, there's a fair number of these things. There were relatives and friends who had been murdered. Uh, uh, happens in Memphis. Uh, it, um, uh, suicide and others were, you know, heart attack of a father and so on and so forth. So there was a wide range of, uh, 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 um, so we, we computed a, a grief network and also a post-traumatic growth network using uh, some of uh, Rich uh, Tedeschi's uh, a PTG um, uh, measures. Uh, and then we also did a combined network to see how these things connected. Because the data, when we're looking at some scores of, say, PTSD symptoms, some scores of post-traumatic growth, but totally confusing. Are there ways of breaking it down to the level of these elements? Can that be revelatory of the relation between these type of uh, clusters? Okay, uh, we also did some novel centrality metrics here briefly. Uh, expected influence centrality. This is um, Don Robin, I, I mentioned earlier, and Alex Milner, postdoc, and I. Uh, we, we developed this uh, a new met, uh, well, these new metrics that. You know, it's sort of one of those, duh, why did you do this in the first place type of thing. Um, what this one simply does is you, you take a node, right? You take a symptom or an element, and it's got positive correlations with other nodes, right? So that adds up into the centrality metric. But 
you can also have red edges, as we say, negative relations. In other words, so the activation of this element actually decreases the activation, or is correlated with it at least, I've got to watch my causal language here, uh, correlated at least with uh, lower values on the other one. And so then we actually look at the absolute, or not the absolute values, but the, we're, we're respecting the sign of both. Now usually, we found we did simulations and stuff in this project, basically what happens unsurprisingly, is when you have all, when all of the edges are positive, all green edges, positive relations, the central, strength centrality and expected influence give you exactly the same numbers. But when you start uh, having negative edges in there, which is somewhat unusual in a syndrome because symptoms of a syndrome tend to cluster together, but with, 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 with here, in this project, you start getting red edges, and so you want to be able to look at the negative influence, like the activation, say, of a post-traumatic growth element. Does that drive down PTSD or vice versa? Expected influence. Um, another metric is a bridge expected influence centrality. Uh, Peyton Jones, uh, one of my graduate students who uh, converted from theoretical physics to psychology as an undergraduate, and, but uh, has brought his uh, uh, quantitative skills to bear on this, you know, writing our packages in his first semester of graduate school. He said, wow, you know, what we really need to do is to get beyond the sort of informal characterization of bridges and be able to actually compute a metric for this. And so what this means then is that if you have a, um, an element, say, in a complicated grief network, right, uh, 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 which one is strongest related to the, the PTSD one, and, or vice versa. You know, so, so it's looking at symptoms that are more likely to activate or, or inhibit symptoms of another cluster. That's what that's about. Anyway, uh, so we had the um, a complicated grief syndrome uh, symptoms initially here. And what this is here, uh, uh, this, whoops, here's the network here. Uh, and what we see is the uh, uh, having a, a loss of control over one's life. So after the person has lost this loved one, they just feel like just, they've lost their sense of agency, a sense of a loss of control, uh, uh, very strong on expected influence. Uh, and also this, uh, the problem with identity. You know, the, the, when you've lost someone and a part of you has, um, it feels like a part of you has died, that your sense of self ha has diminished. And when you actually, uh, uh, whoops, I'll go backwards here. So what this is on the uh, expected influence, one step expected influence, it's looking at uh, respecting the sign of the edges when the dust settles. What we find here is the, the sense of not having control over one's life anymore, that everything's sort of spinning out of control, and the damage uh, uh, to one's identity uh, are the most uh, influential, highly central symptoms uh, in uh, the grief network. Now. Then we look at uh, post-traumatic growth elements, and uh, what we find uh, here is uh, having new pathways in life. That you know that uh, yes, I lost this loved one, but uh, but other things opened up for me. I had new pathways, uh, or I feel uh, in the Nietzsche sense uh, stronger as a result of that. That somehow having survived the loss of this loved one, I feel much more self-confidently resilient, etc., etc., etc. And we see this. Uh, popping up here with, um, uh, with the uh, uh, bridge expected influence. Now, then what we did is to, to combine the networks. Things start getting a little bit uh, uh, busy uh, in, in this sense. But um, what, what we find here uh, is the change of worldview. Uh, that one is a, actually it's a, uh, it's a trauma uh, uh, symptom. So it's like the, the Ronnie, Ronnie um, Janoff Bullman said that when you've shattered assumptions about your world, uh, that, that, you know, that can be uh, strongly related to PTSD symptoms, et cetera, et cetera. What we found, though, is that uh, having to, have to reorient your world in this way, having it shattered and then having to change this, being compelled to change this, is actually was strongly related whoops, uh, to uh, um, the uh, bridge expected influence. And so in other words, that this, uh, this PTSD symptom was correlated with, with actually having post, more post-traumatic growth symptoms. So as shattered as those some assumptions might be, being driven to modify them in the wake of the loss was strongly related to the growth symptoms. Now, and when we look down here, way at the bottom here, uh, is the, uh, uh, um, uh, the, the grief symptom of no longer caring about other people. Notice that this is negative. Uh, okay, and so what, what that means here is that this one is uh, 
<coughs> this is the bad one uh, to have, so to speak. Uh, so the, you're, you're worse off uh, if you've lost the ability to care for others in terms of the, uh, the, uh, um, the grief symptoms. Okay, uh, the next uh, um, data set I wanted to touch on, how am I doing on time? Oh, I'm okay. Um, it was a Bayesian network analysis with uh, OCD, features of OCD, elements of OCD, and uh, those of depression. Now, uh, this project, um, I didn't even know about this form of network analysis at all. Never, uh, but my Pat Patrick Mayer was a statistician colleague of mine. Uh, I, was, um, we, I was presenting some of the data in, a, in this faculty thing, and he goes, uh, Rich, what you should do is Bayesian network analysis. I go, what's that? You know, and so he sort of turned me on to this stuff. So I was learning this here. And Brad Rima, one of my former PhD students, is an OCD. He's got this OCD empire in the United States, one of my students from Chicago days. Um, uh, we sort of joined forces on this project with his postdoc uh, to look at um, a, another totally different way of looking at networks. Um, Bayesian networks are different from the ones I showed before. And uh, what this Bayesian network analysis returns what's called a directed acyclic graph. Um, so we, we have nodes, right, uh, and we have edges or arcs, as some people call them. The difference with the Bayesian network is that they're directed. So they got these little arrowheads. They're sort of pointing from one, say, element or symptom to another. Uh, the networks that I've shown so far have been undirected. They didn't have arrow edges, right? So we don't know whether uh, symptom X is activating symptom Y or Y is activating X, or they're actually you know, mutually influential. These aren't like that. Okay, so these are, uh, so the model that, uh, that arises from the computations is, is gonna show you the direction of prediction and potentially causality. Uh, we have, there's something called a hill climbing algorithm that tests for conditional independence relations among the nodes, um, and, um, what will you do? We, we run this repeated times, right? So we do a thousand iterations of the network bootstrapping samples. And, um, and then the final edge, or excuse me, the final graph, the final network, the final DAG, final directed acyclic graph, um, uh, rep, uh, it shows what edges remain uh, in the network, but it's got to appear in at least 85% of the iterations. And so the same edge keeps popping up. So, and so then the model will say, okay, that, that one's probably for real, retains it. Uh, then, then the next set of analysis uh, goes to look at the direction of the edges, right? So uh, is the arrow pointing this way? Is it pointing that way? And so it's looking at which one, how, you have this data, what model fits the data best? That's, that's the process going on. You point the edge that way, and, uh, doesn't look that good, so it's mainly in this direction, etc. And so uh, if the edge is going from X to Y more than half of the time, that's how it is depicted in the graph. And the thickness of those edges indicates how often it predicted that. I'll show an example in a second. Uh, or the case would be the other way around. All right? So, so, it's, so the, the Bayesian analysis is, is saying, we look at this data. We're going to look at the relations, the uh, uh, conditional independence relations here. And when the dust settles, we're going to give you what looks to be the best picture of uh, what's going on. All right. Uh, now, so the importance of an edge, though, it's a little bit, it, it's different. It means something different in, than in the studies I showed before. The uh, ones I showed before, it, your thickness was the magnitude of the association, right? So it's a correlation coefficient of some for, form um, or a partial correlation. Here, uh, the Bayesian information criterion, the BIC value is, uh, 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 the, the thicker the edge, the bigger, the, the more important, I should say, the more important the edge is to model fit. So for example, suppose we have like a house of cards, right? You're building this house of cards like this, and you say, okay, I'm gonna take the card from the top, and you take it off, house is standing, Whew, okay. Okay, that's a thin edge, right? Not that important to model fit. On the other hand, if I pull a card from the bottom, the whole thing tumbles down. Okay, so these, the thick edges, uh, are uh, showing how important that edge is to model fit. So that's kind of what you're looking at. Uh, and so, so what you see here is when the dust settles, the, the degree to what obsessions are getting in the way of your life 
is strongly predicted of uh, 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 the distress. Oh, these are the, uh, the this is the Y-box self-report measure for the OCD folks know who, what, what I'm referring to here. Uh, these, uh, so you might say, gee, so these are elements or aspects of OCD. Uh, otherwise, you might say, gee whiz, you got a two-node network, obsessions and compulsions, what's the big deal? Yeah. Uh, but what this is sort of breaking it down by the, the, the different elements, so the degree to which they interfere, how much they produce distress, et cetera. And the obsessional distress is actually the gateway to the, uh, the uh, depression symptoms through sadness and anhedonia and so forth. Uh, we have a couple of islands. Um, islands are, are things that are not connected to the main system at all. Uh, so they seem to be relatively uh, independent, interestingly. Now, um, now, if you take a look at um, the, uh, the connection between sadness and suicidality, suicidal thoughts, um, you have uh, 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 an edge there, prediction, you know, in that, uh, that direction. Uh, you know, it's, it's important to the model. Um, whoops. Oh, now you see it here, and you see it's much thicker here, much, much thicker here. And what that means is that um, the direction between sadness to suicidality is much, much stronger in, in all those iterations than the other way around. You know, where people have a lot of suicidal thoughts and then they become sad? Well, not so often. Uh, and so th th this, uh, this is the same graph, but the thickness of the edge signifies how confident we can be that the, the direction of prediction is going that way. Now, of course, uh, so, so uh, the unresolved issues with Bayesian network analysis, you, know, you get the good news, you get the bad news. The bad news are all the assumptions that these mathematicians tell us we better meet or else. So here's the bad news. Uh, well, first of all, uh, 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 this is designed to be a candidate causal system. So this is committing the heresy of making causal inferences from cross-sectional data. Okay. Uh, the Bayesian people, uh, Judea Pearl and some of these people are doing all this modeling sort of work, say under certain circumstances, very strict ones, this can happen. So what are those assumptions? Well, first of all, there's no important unmeasured variables, right? So, so for example, if there's something that really is strongly connected to depression symptoms, OCD symptoms that we somehow didn't measure, uh, well, that, you know, all bets are off. We, we really don't know. Uh, but this is, of course, a challenge for any research study, experimental psychopathology, clinical trials, you name it, right? So getting all of the relevant variables measured, of course, is a big challenge. But that is an assumption. Now, the one that's a little bit closer to home, I think, um, is are DAGs clinically plausible? All right? Uh, the, uh, the problem about plausibility here is, is, is dealing with uh, not have, it's that acyclic word. Acyclic? Well, what does that mean? Well, what that means is, first of all, is that, so we got, it'll show that A, symptom A or feature A, predicts B, and it does so consistently. But it doesn't loop around. And so, you know, Patrick and I, we've talked about this. We know about David Clark's famous model from 1986 in behavior research and therapy. The whole idea that you, you detect certain bodily symptoms, you, you, you appraise them as very th imminently threatening, your arousal goes up, oh my God, and so you get these, a, a positive feedback cycle, right? That cannot be captured in a DAG. Moreover, even if it's a roundabout way, so you go from A to B to C to D, back to A again, you can't do that either. Right, so, so this, the, uh, the algorithms prevent that. Now you can, you can possibly detect, possibly get a clue uh, to cyclicity even in a DAG, but only in one way. So for example, if you have uh, uh, in, in the graphs, whoops, here we go, uh, where you, you see this, uh, um, uh, you know, a really sort of a relatively fine line uh, but between two edges in a direction of prediction graph, DAG, that says, well, yeah, in most of the cases it's going from X to Y, but in a fair number of them the other way around. That suggests potential cyclicity, but you can't detect these longer ones. And so this is an interesting issue. Now there are some very, very recent attempts um, to take uh, um, data that is sampled over time, combining that with um, with the causal modeling, that you can get a, bit, a stronger case uh, uh, of this, including detecting potential cycles. But uh, uh, I didn't want to go, uh, th these things aren't published yet, so we'll see what happens. Okay, um, now I wanna, uh, the last uh, piece of data I want to talk about is uh, 
uh, using, uh, pointing to some other um, type of application, also a different type of networks briefly here. Um, there's been a lot of publicity, as everybody knows, about social media and symptoms of depression and anxiety and envy and all these sorts of things. Uh, Facebook and Instagram are ruining the lives of young people today, at least in America or so goes the tales. And there have been indeed studies, cross-sectional studies, uh, experimental studies that suggest that, um, that you see you have these adverse emotional effects of social media, uh, upward social comparisons that you know, demoralize people and the like. That's kind of the uh, things we've been hearing a lot these days. And so the, uh, this project here was uh, uh, headed by uh, George Albers, who is a, a graduate student uh, from the uh, University of Amsterdam who spent time in my lab, but we were designing the study. Uh, um, there, and then it was run at the University of Amsterdam. See, these are Dutch students, actually, at the University of Amsterdam in this, Dutch undergraduates. It's not a pathological population, but it's a, a one that we were measuring uh, stress and depression symptoms and social media use. And um, somehow it got published in the Journal of Experimental Psychology. It's not an experiment. <laughs> Uh, I, I, I said, well, you know, this would be, it's got broad interest potentially, and I, I told George, I said, we, we, we get a desk rejection. Said, hey, that's not an experiment. Get out of here. They published it. Nobody even brought that up. That's pretty funny. <laughs> so I snuck a non-experiment into the oldest journal uh, of the APA, generally one of the oldest. Okay, so uh, w one of the things that's been a little bit ambiguous here is does social media use, especially passive social media use, you see how to look at it, all those pictures of your friends and all the great news, everybody's having a great life and there you are on your darn computer, you know. Um, does it protect depression, or it's the other way around, when people sort of get down in the dumps, are they more likely to tune into this stuff? Or is it vice versa, right? And so what we did here, we had undergraduates here, 125 of them, 91 uh, women uh, from uh, Amsterdam, and we, uh, we measured them over 14 uh, days. And so basically we, we, we pinged their cell phones, uh, pinged their cell phones uh, seven times a day. It was two hours apart. We had uh, uh, two hours, I won't go into the details, but you need to have these standardized sort of time frames to do this type of analysis. Um, and each time on their smartphone, they answered a, a 12 item questionnaire. It was like you know, these slider scales, zero to 100, sh sh across, all right? Um, the order of the items was uh, randomized. Um, and so we asked them, please indicate to what extent um, the following statements applied to you in the past two hours, okay? And so their question was like, I felt tired. I felt sad. I felt lonely, trouble concentrating, et cetera. I felt st stressed. Um, and going from um, one uh, to, uh, to uh, uh, very much, not all very much. And then I started, you know, we measured uh, passive. We also were looking at um, uh, Asana DeVitt, who's an expert in habit at Amsterdam, who's involved with the team. Uh, we well, I wound up not analyzing these data, but we're measuring how, how automatic, quote unquote, use was. So sort of, you're you get started on social media and before you even know it, or you can't get off of it, et cetera, et cetera. That didn't turn out to be very, um, uh, it wasn't related to anything. Okay, so uh, we did uh, different networks here. This is the Between Subjects Association Network. So this is very similar to the one I showed with earthquake survivors, my first slide. And so we find you know, depression symptoms are, are interrelated here. And, and, and the passive and, uh, 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 passive and active social media issues, yes, they are in fact, there's connections to the depression symptoms and stress. Uh, these are the kind of results that we've seen before. So there's definitely connections there at this level. Uh, so uh, the passive social media use was connected to active um, uh, and, uh, uh, and depressed mood, loneliness, hopelessness, inferiority, all this kind of a thing. So that's kind of what we've been uh, uh, seeing. And also actually active was as well, the same, same, same connections and also loss of interest. So. Um, there have been previous research that suggests that actively posting and commenting on is uh, less, shall we say, pathogenic or, um, for, uh, th than is the passive, but uh, here it didn't make a difference here. Okay, uh, th this is the Between Subjects Concentration uh, Network. Now, what's interesting here with the partial correlations, we, we lose all edges between the media use and the other symptoms once we sort of conditionalize on everything. Now, the contemporaneous network, this is a different type of thing where you're looking at um, in a particular, you got all these folks within a particular 
two hour period. So you're looking at the connections uh, over um, uh, 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 the, the different periods. So you're looking, so what, what symptoms are occurring at this time frame? Now, uh, the, incidentally, this is one of the tricky things with, um, uh, with network analysis is when you're looking at the, t the time frame of measurement. So I gave the example of the catastrophic misinterpretation of bodily sensations and panic disorder. That's pretty darn quick, right? And so a contemporaneous network might pick that up. But if I look at, say, the depression symptom of uh, weight loss, all right, and you've got loss of appetite, and then a few weeks later, boom, your weight's drop, right? You know, so, so the time frames between, say, not eating and losing, noticeably losing body weight, quite long, between saying, oh my God, I'm having a heart attack and having a panic and, uh, and greater arousal, much, much, much shorter. Uh, so th this is to try to catch these windows. But even then, a two-hour one is quite, is, is quite long, but wouldn't necessarily pick up exactly the sort of process they said uh, David is talking about. Um, okay, so uh, what we found here, that within a uh, two-hour time period, what we found that uh, Passive social media use was associated with concentration problems, loss of interest, fatigue, loneliness, right? So these things tend to be hanging together. Uh, and active feelings of inferiority, that's surprised that we, we thought it would be the other way around. Uh, and also concentration problems. Now, the temporal network, this is what you're actually getting, uh, you're looking at, um, uh, 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 the, 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 we're actually looking at um, the autoregressions. So for example, that if you're feeling sad and lonely at one time period, are you feeling sad and lonely at the next one? Uh, uh, this sort of thing. And, and you find, which is typical with a lot of the um, um, EMA studies, ecological momentary assessment studies on mood, where you'll find, especially when people are, are more distressed, if you're sad at time period one, you tend to be quite the same at the time period two, and that predicts, you know, you tend to have this sort of um, inertia, as it's called, emotional inertia, or one time period is autoregressively strongly connected. We tend to see this in, in general here with the depression symptoms, stress, and even the media use. Um, and, and so, uh, so you're looking at how nodes predict one another from one time frame to the next. Now, so this time, now we're actually getting the temporal thing here, right? So we're looking at, so if you're feeling fatigued and lonely, et cetera, uh, that predicts the passive media use. So uh, these things sort of, people start scrolling when they're doing this. Uh, and passive predicts active, those are, those are related. And loneliness and stress predicts the active. Uh, uh, and active negatively uh, was associated with fatigue. I guess it just sort of revs you up and you're sort of telling all these groovy things, cool things you're doing. I don't know. Uh, the MDD symptoms bidirectionally bi predict other MDD symptoms. Uh, and so what we find then is the passive social media use at one time frame did not predict depression symptoms, loneliness, or stress in the next time frame. They didn't. Uh, and so, you know, that was, so the notion that you know, this is a cause of these things worsening. We, we didn't find that. Uh, even because, uh, even when we're dealing with, uh, you know, so-called Granger causality, we're not actually manipulating passive social media use here, but we're looking at its ability to forecast these moods. It wasn't doing so, interestingly enough. But fatigue and loneliness did predict passive me media use in the next uh, time frame. And, and so it seemed to be, the, the direction here was a little bit different from the way it's been uh, predicted in the media, uh, general media, mainstream media, is that, that the media use, social media use is actually the problem here. Uh, passive did not correlate with concentration problems, loss of interest, fatigue, and loneliness from the same time frame. So uh, this is actually, uh, this, this study surprised us more. We thought we were going to confirm a lot of the dire predictions. Not that much, quite frankly. Okay, now what I want to do is just uh, wrap up with just a couple of some of the limitations or challenges, uh, and there are a lot, <laughs> with this new approach, believe me. Um, and um, one is, you know, the fungibility of network and latent variable analysis. I mean, so for example, one of the critiques is if some of the people have been doing dimensional latent variable analyses and so forth for years, they'll say, oh, well, you know, these things are mathematically equivalent. You know, we can convert a network into a latent variable model, factor model, and vice versa, and all that stuff. So what's the big deal? Well, uh, turns out that Ptolemy and, um, and Copernicus, those do, you know, they, they could go back and forth. You know, mathematically, th those are kind of fungible, uh, fungible systems. 
Um, but boy, it does make a difference whether the Earth is going around the sun or the sun is going around the Earth. It really does make a difference. So you can have something that's mathematically fungible, but ontologically very, very distinct. Right? And, and so it matters, for example, whether if you're having problems with your vision and problems with uh, headache pain, uh, it really matters whether or not there is indeed a latent but potentially observable on x-ray brain tumor causing those symptoms or not. Right? And, and so, just as a, so, it, it, so there's ontological issues that are, uh, that are relevant. So it really does make a difference. Because um, uh, with a, 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 a reflective latent variable model, you have a common cause that is the source of the symptoms, you darn well better treat it. Treat that brain tumor. Don't just give somebody some uh, uh, opiates or Tylenol number three or whatever to reduce their pain. That's not going to help. On the other hand, with network analysis, uh, you, 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 you attack the symptoms and the syndrome should go away. So it really does matter. So even though you, something could be mathematically fungible, more or less, uh, ontologically, what's being represented could be really, really different and make a difference. Now, then there's also the issue about uh, symptom centrality. Um, the, your behavior therapists have always known that certain, uh, certain things can activate problems. Uh, oh, for so, let's say someone, for example, is really, really an socially anxious, and so to, to quell their nerves, they drink a lot in public settings. And now they develop alcohol problems. Their social anxiety maybe has waned, but now they keep drinking to prevent themselves from experiencing withdrawal symptoms, right? And so the, so the features that may activate a network or disorder may not be those that are maintaining it, right? So, for example, if someone uh, so leaves a smoldering match among a bunch of newspapers in a house, and a big conflagration occurs, you know. Uh, so wh what happened? Well, someone left a match there, and the house is burning. So you tell the fireman, find that match, turn off that central node. Well, that node's already deactivated, right? So, so what can be? So the uh, the central symptoms, it may or may we have to make this distinction whether they are initiating the process, maintaining it, or both. <clears throat> then there's this problem of ergodicity. Um, th th this one here, well, what this is, ref uh, this is some stuff from statistical mechanics from the 1930s uh, that uh, some psychometricians have pointed out, that the structure of variance within a person may uh, be different from that between people, right? Uh, and, um, and sometimes, uh, many times, that, that doesn't hold. And, and so, so when we look at, for example, oh, uh, the high top models, the dimensional models of psychopathology, those are all between subject type of things, and they may or may not be revelatory of processes occurring in the individual. A, 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 a sort of a similar, pro so they may not be ergodic. So in other words, if you can flip between processes in the individual and between individuals, among individuals, um, then you have ergodic processes. In physics, you find that a lot, but you don't find it so much in our field so much. Um, and so a, 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 a distinction that might be relevant to this is between, say, uh, getting back to panic disorder for a second, uh, people who are, say, high in anxiety sensitivity, high, high in AS, the ASI, anxiety sensitivity index, are more likely than people who are not to panic when, say, challenged with carbon dioxide. But, um, but that's a between-subject thing, right? So you're talking about between-subject uh, sorts of things. Uh, and what, uh, the catastrophic misinterpretation process, that's a within-subject thing. That's an occurrent process, not a dispositional one. And so we do have these type of distinctions that, that are relevant uh, to this. Now, what that has meant, practically speaking, is that we look at cross-sectional networks, right? And the structure of these snapshots that I've shown in several of the studies uh, can be different from the sort of repeated measures of individuals over time. And so we see a lot of emphasis now on looking as processes unfold in the individual and subjecting them to network analyses. Um, and uh, let's see, oh, oh, and actually relevant to this, I just want to mention this. One of the m mathematical problems that has come up is that when you do the networks on people on individually, you have to have this thing about stationarity. You know, they say, oh, we talk, have to be, how to satisfy qualify a, a stationary process. What that means is that the mean invariances aren't changing across time. And we, wait a second, with clinical psychologists, that's what we want to have happen. The, you got the high means, we want to help these people. We want the symptoms to be going down. And then the mathematician says, oh, but it's not a stationary process. Well, I say, well, how, what good are you guys to us? Um, well, there's a number of different ways where this might work. You know, one is, is looking at stationarity before treatment and after treatment. That's one way of doing that. One potential. That's the easy way of doing that. Uh, the, the math guy, the mathematicians are working out ways, different ways to, 
still make this work. And uh, sometimes you're detrending, and I don't want to go too much into this, but detrending things, but we want these trends, but clinically. That's related to the ergodicity thing. Okay, now, so then it's just about selecting clinical subjects, right? Uh, by that I mean, uh, you have these problems. So let's suppose, for example, um, you are saying, okay, what is uh, you know, the network structure of uh, bipolar disorder or whatever, or panic disorder, or whatever, and so you select people, meet the diagnosis, et cetera, et cetera. Um, w another way of doing this is looking at these symptoms in the whole population. Uh, now, sometimes what will happen when you have a, um, say, a diagnostic threshold, right, so you're conditionalizing on meeting the diagnosis. Okay, we're looking at like Alex, uh, uh, Aaron and I did. We had people who met the social anxiety disorder criteria. Then we look at the network, right? Uh, occasionally, when you conditionalize on something that is correlated to the things you're measuring, it can throw things off. You have this, it's called conditioning on a collider, you know. Um, now, you don't have that problem with the PTSD studies or the grief studies. So we say, well, we're going to take a whole bunch of folks who are spousal bereavement, okay, uh, or have been exposed to a trauma. That's not the same thing. But sometimes when you're focusing in on a diagnosis, that may be different than if you look at the whole population on those measures. These are just issues. Sometimes it's a problem, sometimes not. Sometimes the network will change a lot. Um, and, uh, and finally, the last one, of course, is you know, heterogeneity among patients. Uh, my uh, former student, uh, Don Robinow, he is um, assistant professor in psychiatry now. He's, he's still at Harvard, but he's over in the psychiatry. And he's doing some work, a treatment work on complicated grief, CBT for complicated grief. And what he's, what he's finding, and looking at individual networks, and is that you have people who can meet the provisional DSM criteria for complicated grief, uh, but their networks, the network structures differ fr from patient to patient. Uh, and so what we see with the cross-sectional analyses is the general tendencies, right? You saw, oh, this is a high centrality symptom and with people with this diagnosis, et cetera, et cetera. But you can find very, everybody knows about heterogeneity. And how that cashes out in the network analysis uh, is that you give different nodes are more central, et cetera, et cetera. So, for example, this inability to, force, to see the future, right? To, to, to uh, you know, there, there's the, the brief person who sort of sees a blank wall when it comes to imagining life without their spouse, for example. Not everybody has that. Uh, other people have, you know, they, they have a painful emo physical, emotional pain or they, things of this sort. So you can get different networks with individuals. But that's not a criticism of network analysis. It's only simply saying that, that you can characterize the problem of heterogeneity uh, in, by looking at the networks that people have versus, say, subtyping. Ad infinitum, you know, breaking people into a million different subtypes, you know, slicing and dicing into different smaller and smaller categories. You can do that as well, but you can also look at it from this viewpoint. And so I, this, I think I'm on time right now, so I'm going to thank you for your attention.